Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we've got another video in our battle series. Today, we're going to talk about the Battle of Midway. And it is the anniversary of the Battle of Midway, which primarily took place on June 4th, 1942, roughly six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. We've previously shot a video where we talked about Midway uh, and some of the other early battles, but we decided it's significant enough that we're going to make a whole video about it. So, the United States launches the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo, it establishes the American aircraft carriers as a nuisance and a legitimate threat to the Japanese. Admiral Yamamoto has to come up with a plan to uh, lure out the American carriers and destroy them. Following the Battle of the Coral Sea, the United States only has four carriers, Enterprise and Hornet in Task Force 16 under Admiral Halsey, and the damaged Saratoga and the damaged Yorktown. Saratoga had been hit by a, a submarine-launched torpedo earlier in the war, uh, and Yorktown has just received a couple of dive bomber hits at the Battle of the Coral Sea. Somehow she's managed to limp her way back into port at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese, on the other hand, have somewhere around 10 aircraft carriers at this point. Uh, at least six of them are big fleet carriers, and the rest are various medium carriers and, and light carriers, which have been converted from other types of ships. So the Japanese really hold an advantage here. Rather than press that advantage and consolidate, though, the Japanese war plans and uh, Admiral Yamamoto's plans for the Battle of Midway in particular are extremely complex and involve sending navies all over God's great earth. So in May, Yamamoto had taken two of his big carriers, Shokaku and Zuikaku, and sent them to the Coral Sea, where one had been damaged and one had lost uh, enough of her air group that she wasn't going to participate in this battle. Neither one would be ready to go until July or August. Yamamoto uh, decided, yeah, we've still got enough carrier superiority, so we'll go on without them. However, he plans the midway operation using basically every ship in the Imperial Japanese Navy uh, and has four different major task forces out there. He's got his carrier task force, the Kido Butai, based around the carriers Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu of the 1st and 2nd Carrier Divisions, uh, and under the command of Admiral Chuichi Nagumo. Uh, they are the main attack force. They're going to neutralize Midway Atoll and then hang out in the area and wait for the American carriers to come in so that they can be ambushed. Meanwhile, he's got another force invading the Aleutian Islands to try and confuse, distract, divert the Americans. Uh, Another force, which is the invasion force. Uh, he, he's got a carrier going up to the Aleutians too. He's got another carrier with his invasion forces, and uh, which also includes his own flagship and the battleships. And Yamamoto decides to go at sea on the battleship Yamato uh, during this battle. The problem is when you're at sea, uh, you got to maintain radio silence so that the enemy doesn't pick up where you are. If the U.S. starts seeing a bunch of radio signals coming from the middle of the Pacific Ocean where there aren't any islands, well, then one could assume that there might be a Japanese fleet there. Uh, and this basically removes Yamamoto from the battle. By choosing to participate in the battle, he is removing himself from command. He, he cannot pass on orders. He cannot pass on intel that he receives. Uh, and, and so he doesn't play a part in the battle, brilliant a strategist though he may be. Meanwhile, Admiral Chester Nimitz, his counterpart commanding the Pacific Fleet for the Allies, uh, remains in Pearl Harbor and is able to feed information to his on-site commanders. Another Japanese force in the area is a group of cruisers, which are going to bombard Midway. And the Japanese don't really have any shore bombardment doctrine, uh, so really, Using this force is kind of absurd. They don't have air cover. They're too far from the other ships in the various task forces, and uh, they can't really effectively participate in the battle. They would have been much more effective providing anti-aircraft escort to his aircraft carriers, but that's not the case. As it is, the American carriers go out, uh, each with a couple of cruisers and destroyers uh, supporting them, 
while the Japanese go out with a much smaller force, although they do have two battleships and, and two heavy cruisers and some destroyers. When, when you divide it among the four carriers, the, the Americans bring more escorts per carrier than the Japanese. This is partly because these are the last three operational American carriers, so they are a hot commodity, whereas uh, the Japanese, these are four of 10 carriers that we've got. Maybe, maybe we don't need them. Plus, we got all these other operations going on, so we need escorts all over the place there too. So uh, that's the Japanese side of things. They're gonna come in, attack Midway, uh, land on and invade Midway. And then the American carriers, which after the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Japanese assume are still to the south, will meander their way up, take the Japanese bait, uh, and get ambushed by the Japanese carriers somewhere around Midway. It's an okay plan, I guess. Uh, the Japanese are burning basically all of their fuel reserves by putting all these ships to sea and most of them won't participate in the battle at all. Uh, but you do what you do. The American plan, on the other hand, is informed by their code breaking of the Japanese codes. The Japanese Navy is using a code called JN25, and the Allies have broken enough of it that, that they have a pretty complete picture of what the Japanese are saying. Before the battle, the Japanese are gonna change their code uh, but enough of the planning takes place with JN-25 that the Americans are able to, one, know the complete order of battle of the Japanese fleet, and two, they're able to set a trap to determine where the Japanese are going. Breaking the enemy code is one thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can do anything with it. So, uh, for example, in addition to being in code, Different locations have code names too. The various plans talk about an attack on an American base called AF. Where's AF? American code breakers are pretty sure that the Japanese are gonna attack Midway. It's their furthest base out there. Uh, and, and so they're fairly certain the attack's gonna come there already. But just to be sure, they come up with this idea of sending a message through a uh, submerged cable, so because it's going through a hard wire, it can't be intercepted. And they tell Midway Island to send a uncoded message over the open airwaves saying that their freshwater condensers are broken and they need new water. The Japanese hear this message, don't think anything of the fact that it's broadcast in the clear, and then broadcast in code uh, around the fleet that AF is low on fresh water. So this tells Nimitz, not 100%, but, but he's pretty sure now that the attack is coming on Midway and that's where he needs to commit his forces to ambush the Japanese. Not everyone agrees with him. Some people think that, hey, maybe this is just a little too convenient that they fell for our trap. Uh, and, and some people are, are legitimately scared that, the west coast of the United States is the biggest threat. What if the Japanese are going to attack there? So Nimitz makes a uh, compromise. He leaves Task Force One, which are the seven Pacific Fleet battleships on the west coast. These battleships are partially ships transferred from the Atlantic following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, that would be the New Mexico class, New Mexico, Mississippi, and Idaho. It's the battleship Colorado, which had missed the attack on Pearl Harbor because she was in Puget Sound. And it's the ships that survived the attack on Pearl Harbor, relatively undamaged, that were able to be repaired. Maryland, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania. These ships have been training on the West Coast for now six months, and they're probably a more effective fighting force than the battle force that was lost at Pearl Harbor. Doesn't matter because they drink fuel like crazy, so, uh, and they're the last line of defense. So they, they never actually get committed. But Nimitz saying, hey, I'll leave these guys on the West Coast. If the Japanese do come and attack, you'll have those to protect you. Uh, but I'm gonna take my remaining carriers and go make this uh, strike. I believe in it as surely as anybody can know something in the fog of war. And uh, it shows one of the great qualities of Nimitz that he will commit when he thinks he's got a reasonable chance. 
there, there are so many people who are by not knowing all the facts. And so they would do nothing in this situation or folks who might have seen the initial reports and committed everything straight away, whereas Nimitz at least waited to try and get confirmation and then doesn't commit everything he's got. He, he leaves the battleships behind. I really respect Nimitz as a commander for making very hard decisions like that. The American force will be comprised of Enterprise and Hornet, Task Force 16. Normally, this task force would be commanded by Admiral William Halsey. Halsey has been commanding this task force through a number of island raids in the South Pacific and through the Doolittle Raid. And uh, the, the stress of being in command for the first six months of the war has started to get to him. And uh, he's lost a ton of weight and he breaks out in a terrible debilitating case of shingles that ends up hospitalizing him in Pearl Harbor. So he is ordered to miss the battle. This plays into the American favor. The, the Japanese were really counting on America's premier carrier admiral, Halsey, who is known for his aggressiveness. Uh, they're, they're really counting on him being their enemy. So they make their plan based on that. Who could have known that Halsey would burn himself out? Halsey's hand-picked successor is Raymond Spruance. Spruance is a cruiser commander. He's never commanded a carrier uh, or flown an aircraft in his life. But Halsey has seen Spruance uh, escort his carriers from one side of the Pacific to the other and decides that uh, he's the right guy. He, he knows Task Force 16's operations. Uh, so Halsey leaves his staff with Spruance and uh, allows the much more cautious uh, Spruance to command his force during this battle. The overall commander on the American side is Frank Jack Fletcher, who is commanding Task Force 17, centered around the aircraft carrier Yorktown. Yorktown was disabled after the Battle of the Coral Sea and barely manages to hobble back into Pearl Harbor. Nimitz orders that within 72 hours, she's going to put to sea again. So he has everyone at the Pearl Harbor Navy Yard work around the clock to make what repairs they can to get her back to sea. Yorktown is one of my favorite ships of all time, and we're gonna do a separate video about her in the near future. So I won't talk too much about that here, uh, but they're able to perform this Herculean task on a ship that the Japanese thought they had sunk. Uh, and so they're able to get all three Yorktown class aircraft carriers north of Midway Island at a point called Point Luck. Uh, to wait in ambush for the Japanese fleet. Since the war started, Midway Atoll has been steadily uh, increased in its fortifications. Various treaties between the United States, Great Britain, and Japan during the interwar period prevented the various island bases from being fortified any further than they already were. This very much worked in Japan's favor. However, since the war has started, the United States has been sending every available uh, gun and aircraft to uh, Midway Island. It's very much a pickup force, uh, all sorts of different aircraft, heavy bombers, medium bombers, Navy and Marine Corps uh, bombers that would normally be based on aircraft carriers. Uh, some of them modern, like the B-17 Flying Fortress, other ones uh, brand spanking new, like the soon to be dubbed TBM Avenger torpedo bomber, uh, and others are utterly obsolete. The Vindicator dive bomber and the Buffalo fighter plane. Regardless, anything that uh, can be spared from other places is sent to Midway. One of the modern aspects of Midway defense are the PBY uh, Catalina flying boats, which can be used to scout. These search planes since the Americans roughly know what the Japanese plans are, their order of battle, and when they plan to attack, are really concentrating their search uh, due east during the uh, lead up to the attack on Midway. And sure enough, June 4th, they start to spot these Japanese, air, uh, these Japanese formations coming in. First, they spot the large, slow-moving Japanese invasion force. Uh, and later, they spot the Japanese carrier force. They're able to radio all this information back to Midway. So Midway isn't caught surprised like so many other allied bases up to this point in the war. Midway scrambles everything they have. 
They know that the Japanese are going to launch an attack on them first to neutralize their airfields. Uh, and so they get all their fighters in the air as a combat air patrol. They keep them all. They don't send any with their air groups. All of their aircraft, they launch to attack the Japanese fleet. The American aircraft attacking the Japanese fleet, they don't have good luck. The U.S. used their heavy bombers like the B-17s, and uh, these are great at bombing stationary land targets. Can't hit a moving ship. I'm not sure a heavy bomber has ever hit a moving ship. Uh, even with the carpet bombing that, that they do, they score no hits. Then some of the medium bombers retrofitted as torpedo bombers uh, and the brand new Avenger torpedo bombers go in to launch torpedo attacks. Well, the, these low, slow flying aircraft are easily chewed up by the Japanese fighter cover. Uh, successive waves of dive bombers and other aircraft from Midway also go against the Japanese carriers, uh, and they're hitting pretty much like clockwork every 10 minutes throughout the morning. And uh, every single time, the Japanese are able to intercept them and shoot them down. Meanwhile, at Midway, more than half of the Japanese carrier fleet's aircraft are attacking. The other half has been kept in reserve for a possible second strike, like was launched on Pearl Harbor, or in case American surface ships are detected. The uh, Japanese have also put out search aircraft. They tend to use uh, their cruiser float planes, and they have two excellent uh, scout cruisers in the form of Tone and Chikuma, uh, which have all their guns concentrated forward and have these uh, aircraft handling facilities on the fantail. So they're putting out scouting aircraft in all directions, uh, at least to their uh, to their east, uh, so that they can uh, see if there's any American surface ships guarding Midway. The first Japanese strike wave hits Midway, and they're able to plow through the American fighter cover. Again, they're, they're old and obsolete aircraft by and large. Uh, even the up-to-date Wildcat fighters are still outmatched by the Japanese Zeros. And they're able to press the attack. There's a tremendous amount of American air anti-aircraft defense. Uh, and it turns out really difficult to uh, destroy a land-based airfield. Pretty easy to sink an aircraft carrier, but when your aircraft carrier is a chunk of coral rock in the Pacific, much more difficult to sink or disable it. And Midway is actually uh, two airfields. There's one on Sand Island, one on Eastern Island. Uh, so the Japanese are unable to render the airfields inoperable. So they radio back that uh, a second strike at minimum is gonna be needed before an amphibious invasion. So the Japanese start to arm their aircraft with high explosive bombs that will explode on impact uh, for their dive bombers. And for their torpedo bombers, they load bombs instead of torpedoes for attacking land sites. Then their Japanese scout planes start to see American ships. Uh, some of their scout planes have radio problems. Uh, and the, the ones that see American carriers, the, their radio messages don't go through, just pure luck or misfortune, as uh, depending on which side you're on. The uh, other ones see the American force, but don't see carriers right away. So Nagumo is stuck with a really tough decision. He's got to decide if he's going to attack American ships and arm his aircraft accordingly, or if he's going to launch this follow-up attack for the invasion forces. Uh, and he's trying to decide, he's trying to get more information. Meanwhile, Yamamoto might have some information that could help him, but again, he can't radio it. His, uh, he knows that the uh, planned submarine scouting uh, group that would spot the American carriers on approach isn't in position yet. He also knows that the planned float plane sortie that was going to launch from French Frigate Shoals to uh, spy on Pearl Harbor and see if there are any uh, American carriers in port also got chased away because the Japanese had done that operation uh, months earlier as well. So the Americans established a presence at French Frigate Shoals. And so when the Japanese come back to do it a second time, uh, they're driven off before they ever get anywhere near Hawaii. So Yamamoto knows that they have not in fact scouted for the American carriers. They don't know where they are. Uh, if Nagumo had this information, he might've been able to make a decision. He doesn't have it. He knows there are American ships nearby, but he doesn't know what they are. Uh, and he's not quite sure 
at this point, his objective is supposed to be to neutralize Midway. The American ships aren't supposed to be close by. Uh, so does he drop that and go after the American ships? Or does he stay with his primary objective? Uh, and he doesn't really get the chance to make a decision. American aircraft continue to attack him. The carriers by this point have gotten into range and launched their full air groups. The American carriers are far less well-trained at this point than their Japanese counterparts. Um, while Yorktown and Enterprise have launched raids on the Japanese, uh, that's significantly different from a carrier battle. Hornet is brand new to the war. She carried army bombers for the Doolittle raid and hasn't really done anything with her own air group. Uh, meanwhile, Yorktown's actual air group that has been in a carrier battle at the Coral Sea uh, was chewed up to the point that they've been rotated off and sent home and Saratoga's air group has been plugged in. It's a huge doctrinal difference between the U.S. and the Japanese. The U.S., the air group, and the carrier are two separate things. So you can take any air group and plug it in on any carrier. Uh, and so Yorktown, even though she was in a fight just a month earlier, is able to go back out. With the Japanese, your carrier aircraft and your uh, carrier are one unit. So if your carrier is in perfectly good shape, except it doesn't have aircraft, you got to wait for new aircraft. You can't just take other air groups and put it on there. The Japanese are really well trained, though. And during the Battle of Midway, uh, some Japanese pilots not uh, with the Japanese air groups, carrier air groups, were embarked for operations uh, to, to take over Midway Island and, and for other things. Uh, and they are able to very well integrate with the existing carrier air groups, and they fly operations from the carriers during the battle, proving that the Japanese are able to do this if they want to. Again, they're the best carrier pilots in the world at this point. They, Japanese uh, doctrine just doesn't allow them to operate like that. So not only do they not have one of their fleet carriers because it doesn't have aircraft, all of the four fleet carriers they do have, which have been fighting nonstop around the Pacific, since uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, have not had their aircraft replenished. So they're all going into battle with lower than normal air groups. So even though the Japanese have more carriers, uh, the Americans have three to their four, the Kido Butai. Uh, functionally, the Americans have as many flight decks because they've got Midway plus the three carriers. And the American carriers have relatively full air groups. Uh, and so the Americans have way uh, more aircraft per carrier and thus uh, are able to even out the battle. So Midway Island has been launching airstrikes against the Japanese, and now American carrier aircraft start to attack the Japanese. Uh, the American pilots aren't as well trained, so rather than coming in as one cohesive group with the fighters escorting the dive bombers and the torpedo bombers and attacking in one coordinated uh, attack. That's not what happens. Uh, by a fluke, all of the three squadrons of American torpedo bombers find the Japanese fleet first. And they, they come about this in a number of different ways, uh, but they are able to find the Japanese fleet and the other uh, parts of the air group are still having issues. So wave after wave of torpedo bomber comes in at the Japanese carriers and the Japanese Zero fighters chew them up. They've got to come in low and slow to launch their torpedoes. And so they're sitting ducks for the uh, fighters and anti-aircraft fire. As it turns out, the uh, Japanese Zeros, like we talked about last episode, uh, the Japanese air defense network that they form around their carriers is not particularly sophisticated. And once you've engaged it, it's very hard for it to reposition. So the Japanese combat air patrol goes lower and lower and lower, fighting wave after wave of torpedo bombers and ends up uh, completely out of position. The Americans had a ring of picket submarines around Midway to search for the Japanese. One of those submarines, I believe Nautilus, uh, spots Japanese carrier and fires a torpedo. One of the torpedoes even manages to hit 
I want to say Akagi, uh, but fails to detonate. The Americans have all sorts of torpedo issues at this point in the war. However, when this happens, there's a trail of bubbles leading back from the torpedo launch to the submarine. So a Japanese destroyer goes down and uh, starts dropping depth charges on the American submarine. Uh, and it has to stay there and suppress that submarine until the carriers have moved out of the area. So once that has happened, this destroyer has to leave Nautilus and make a high-speed run to the north to find the Japanese carriers. The American dive bombers have been following the reports by American flying boats telling them where the Japanese were. So they show up on that location, or where the Japanese should be if they had continued in that direction. Well, it turns out the Japanese had maneuvered and uh, turned off course, and the Americans didn't know where they were. However, with their fuel tanks nearly, nearly empty, at least to the point that they had to make a return trip, uh, nearly half empty, they spot the Japanese destroyer, see that it is sailing towards the north, and correctly deduce that that means it must be sailing towards the Japanese fleet. And so the uh, five bomber squadrons from Yorktown and Enterprise are able to do this, find the Japanese and uh, attack. And they're able to sink three of the Japanese carriers, not outright, but uh, do enough damage that three of the carriers are sunk because of damage sustained during this attack. Yorktown's dive bombers concentrate on one of the Japanese carriers. Enterprise's dive bombers concentrate on Kaga. And a couple of the Enterprise pilots, seeing that they're concentrating, uh, manage to pull up, I want to say it's only three of them, and decide to attack the flagship Akagi instead. Uh, but regardless, they're all able to score hits. And these hits do tremendous damage because the Japanese uh, were still trying to decide whether they were going to launch an attack on the American uh, surface ships or on Midway. By this point, they've heard that there may be at least one carrier with the American surface ships. Uh, so, so Nagumo has to decide what to do at this point. So he orders his planes, which had been armed for the land attack, to be rearmed. At this point, his Midway attack force is starting to show up overhead but he's being continuously attacked, continuously attacked. So he can't turn into the wind to launch his uh, aircraft. He's been dodging torpedo bombers. Uh, so when the torpedo bombers stop, he's finally able to start launching aircraft. American aircraft tend to be armed on the flight decks. Japanese aircraft are armed in the hangars. So when the Americans show up with armor-piercing bombs, and start uh, dive bombing, the Japanese fighters are way out of position. The Japanese had no early warning network to detect them, uh, and their hangars are filled with both fully fueled and bomb-laden aircraft, and all of the high explosive land attack bombs that had been removed from those aircraft, uh, they're all laying around. So any hit causes chain reaction of explosions. These hits would have been enough to sink almost any carrier in the war. Uh, it certainly doesn't help that the Japanese don't have as refined a damage control technique as the Americans. But in one fell swoop, Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu are disabled and will sink. Nagumo is, uh, survives and is able to switch his flag to the light cruiser Nagara, but he's basically out of the fight. So command, uh, reverts to the Japanese second in charge and uh, Admiral Yamaguchi, who is extremely aggressive. And he's on uh, Hiryu, the, the last surviving Japanese carrier. At this point, the Japanese can still withdraw and maintain one of their fleet carriers and possibly regroup with their other carriers. They don't know it, but the American aircraft carriers have mostly used up their aircraft. Most of Hornet's aircraft, with the exception of the torpedo bombers, uh, fail to find the Japanese fleet, fail to find the American fleet, and disappear over the Pacific. Uh, Yorktown and Enterprise both lose a significant number of their attacking aircraft, particularly in the torpedo bomber department. Their dive bombers 
are able to make it home and they're able to, to make a squadron or two worth of aircraft out of the remaining uh, dive bombers. The, the Americans aren't in great shape at this point. Uh, the Japanese could withdraw now, combine some of their other carriers, and still press the attack. Yamaguchi's uh, aggressive, though, and he chooses not to. Uh, he believes that the Americans only have one carrier, despite the number of aircraft he's seen attacking. He assumes most of them are coming from Midway, and most of them have been shot down, so they're not going to come from Midway again. Uh, so he launches an air attack. Uh, whatever he has on hand on his own ship, loaded with whatever ordnance they have at the time, towards the last known position. His uh, pilots are extremely well trained, so they're able to find Yorktown, and uh, they're able to launch a pincer attack and uh, do damage to Yorktown. When they leave her, she's on fire, uh, and she's slowed to a stop. Her boilers uh, have had their fires blown out. So they assume that they have sunk that American carrier, or at least disabled it out of the battle. They return to hear you. Uh, a new group is loaded up and refueled and sent out in case there's another American carrier. Meanwhile, Yorktown and Enterprise have launched another attack against uh, Hiryu, and uh, their dive bombers are able to find Hiryu and sink her. Hiryu's aircraft are able to find Yorktown again. Yorktown's damage control at this point is Herculean. Uh, they have not only repaired the flight deck so they can continue to operate, but they have gotten their boilers running so they're, they're moving at high speed. So the Japanese see another Yorktown-class aircraft carrier, seemingly undamaged, attack it, and are able to score bomb and torpedo hits, again disabling the ship. So they at this point think they have sunk all three Yorktown-class aircraft carriers, one at the Coral Sea and two at Midway. Uh, in fact, they've attacked the same carrier three times, and they still haven't sunk her. Uh, at this point, the Japanese are out of carriers of their own, though. Uh, so Admiral Yamamoto finally breaks radio silence and orders the attack called off. Uh, his ships start to return for home. The battle isn't quite over yet. On the 5th, the Americans have a couple of dive bombers left, and they notice those four Japanese heavy cruisers that were going to bombard Midway. Uh, and they're basically unescorted. They've got no air support. So they decide to launch some dive bombers on them. Uh, and two of these four cruisers, while they're maneuvering at night, run into each other. Uh, Mogami is a very unlucky ship, and she rams one of her sister ships. And uh, so two of these cruisers are not able to keep up with the other two. And the American dive bombers catch them, and they're able to damage the unlucky Mogami and sink the other uh, Mogami-class cruiser, which, whose name escapes me right now. I'm, I'm sure you guys can tell me in the comments section. Uh, anyway, uh, that's pretty much the end of the battle. At this point, Spruance has taken command because Fletcher's flagship is knocked out, and uh, it's decided we've done enough for one day. We've got no aircraft left, basically. Let's retreat. Uh, the Japanese have retreated from Midway, so the battle is a tactical and strategic victory for the United States. But uh, it's not quite over yet. Poor Yorktown uh, is caught by one of those Japanese submarines that was supposed to be forming a picket uh, to catch them, the Americans, while they came towards Midway. Uh, this submarine, uh, it might be I-19, spots her uh, leaking oil and listing badly and uh, is able to sneak through the screen of escorting destroyers, launch a torpedo attack and on the 6th, which sinks the destroyer Hammond, which is helping Yorktown, uh, and puts a couple torpedoes in Yorktown. Yorktown uh, manages to stay afloat overnight, and uh, it's not until the 7th that she finally rolls over and sinks after basically a month of unrelenting punishment. Again, I'm going to talk about uh, Yorktown in a future video. Absolutely love her. But that is the end of the Battle of Midway.
the United States has pretty much evened the playing field with the Japanese in terms of carriers. Going forward, uh, new American Essex class carriers are going to start to come online um, within the year. New American battleships are going to start to come online uh, and be deployed to the Pacific within months. And the Japanese basically don't go on the offensive again. They, they fail to take Midway and they pull back into their defensive ring of islands. And so the Americans are able to go on the offensive and they start to attack at Guadalcanal. And uh, from there, it's just unrelenting allied amphibious invasions on multiple fronts, uh, slowly chipping their way through the various Japanese rings of defenses. Midway proves the Coral Sea wasn't a fluke. Carriers are capital ships in their own right, and they can win battles and fight battles without surface ships ever getting involved. It also provides further evidence that uh, carriers are heavyweight hitters, but they've got a glass jaw. If, if they take a hit of their own, they tend to be disabled. Having now watched our videos on the Coral Sea and Midway, which of the two do you think is more historically significant? Let us know in the comment section down below. Midway tends to get a lot of the credit, but uh, it's not actually the first of anything. And uh, there's a fair amount of luck involved. So which of those two battles is actually more critical to the war? Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State uh, and also from a number of businesses and private individuals. In particular, viewers like you have allowed this channel to grow over the last year. We really appreciate your donations. We're making multiple pieces of content per uh, week. So remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when that goes out. And if you'd like to support us even more than that, there's a link in the description for a way you can donate. Thanks for watching.